Just when you thought I was going to let you off the hook and end this series, I decided to go ahead and make an alignment video, which I usually don't do. But Zeniths are pretty straightforward, and there's a lot of them, so it wouldn't hurt to see it. So we do a couple of details in this one, and mostly we do an alignment. Here we go. Okay, now I'm going to deal with something that is a detail, but it's actually pretty visible. And that's this gasket that goes around the, the dial glass. So the first thing you have to do is bend all these tabs up because you need to get the dial glass out of there. You want to be careful not to bend them back and forth too many times because these things will crack and break right off. I'm real lucky on this particular escutcheon because all the tabs are there. But a lot of these that I work on, there are tabs missing. Make sure you bend them back far enough so that you can lift the glass out real easily. It's And that's... that's not a small thing. You have to bend them back quite a bit if this glass is going to lift straight out. And the reason you want to do that is because when you put the glass back in with the new gasket, it's going to take up a, a little more space. So these tabs need to be back far enough. Just keep working them slowly and gently. And once you get them all back far enough, you just lift the glass right out. Then you just take the old gasket material off of it. And, and here, check this out, man. I can get new gasket material, but it isn't quite the same size. This stuff, uh, the new gasket material has a deeper channel, and it's a little bit thicker rubber, so it doesn't quite fit as well as the old gasket material. I mean, it'll fit on the glass, it'll stay on the glass, but it's because it's taller, it takes up more space, and that's why I wanted you to make sure you bent those tabs back enough. You don't want to be bending the tabs back and forth, so you just bend them back far enough on the first shot. So go ahead and clean out all the tabs, get everything clean all the way around, and uh, get the glass clean too. Make sure you get all the crap off the glass. And I'm going to save these pieces because I'm still actively looking for a channel that is the exact right size, so I don't have to deal with this. I like this channel, this channel material. I get it at radio days, but uh, because it's not exactly the right size, I'm always looking for something that will work a little better. I gently will scrape all the old rubber material off the glass. Be really careful because these edges are sharp and this glass will cut you even if it's not broken and the glass is thin. So just real gently with your fingernail, just scrape it all the way, get it as clean as you possibly can. All the while, be very mindful of the fact that this glass is thin and it's, it's really pretty brittle. So I'm going to take it in the other room and I'm going to wash it up real quick and I'll bring it right back. Make another go around with your small screwdriver and clean out all the debris from the channel or the space that this glass fits in and uh, get all the tabs really clean. Make sure there's no rubber uh, still in there. This rubber, this dry, hard, brittle rubber will stick to things and you'll have to scrape it off in places. So just get all that really clean. When I work on this dial glass, I'm worried about not just breaking it, but I'm also worried about scratching it. So I put a nice thick towel, fold it over usually, uh, on my bench as a surface on which to work. I've cleaned the dial glass and now I just take this rubber, this rubber channel that I got from Radio Days and I begin to just place it around the glass. And you'll notice something if you buy this rubber, it doesn't fit super tightly, it fits kind of tightly, but not tightly enough to hold it on the glass. Plus when mine was shipped to me, they coiled it up so that it had a set that resisted um, the curvature of the glass. It kind of wanted to peel itself off over and over. so. Um, you want to be aware of that, that you're going to have to glue this glass on. See how it peels away? So I use super glue, and I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. I'm using super glue gel here, and I don't want it to run all over the place. And I start at the center of the channel, the middle part of the channel section that I'm working with. And I put a little dollop of glue in there. Not a lot, just a, just a little bit. I don't want the stuff squeezing out getting all over the glass. And then I take it and I, I set it on the glass right here like this. Then little by little, I'll, about every two or three inches, I'll put another spot of glue and I'll work the, the uh, channel around the glass like that. But you'll notice something, even with the glue, it does not want to stay in place. So the best thing to do is to take a little bit of tape and where you've put the glue, take the tape and just hold it in place. Don't put it on too tightly and, and if you can, kind of have the tape not, don't push the tape down, down against right next to where the glue is. You don't want to get the glue squeezing out between the tape and the glass. So just kind of wrap the tape around the rubber and pull it tight against the glass, but don't press it down real hard because then you'll get tape, you'll get glue squeezing out. 
I didn't have one continuous piece of rubber that was long enough to go all the way around this dial glass. So I had to use two pieces. Normally you won't have to do this, but I had two splices of the rubber instead of just one. It's no big deal. You just do them both the same way. Tape this piece down too, and then you'll wind up, once you get it in place, you'll wind up putting a spot of glue on the ends and pushing the ends together. So you'll kind of want to cut it just a, a tiny bit long so that when you put the ends together, they kind of push against each other. And, and so just uh, grab your, your favorite knife, cut it off, and then get, you've got it all glued down, and then you take and put just a tiny bit of glue on the ends right there, right there where I have my thumb right now. That's where I'm going to put a spot of glue, and you'll push them together. Don't put a big spot there. Once you get that spot there, then you, you kind of push that last little bit of the, new, of the new gasket on, and real gently you kind of stretch the two pieces together with one hand and hold them together. Just hold them firmly for about a minute. And uh, nothing works like super glue and rubber. Rubber to itself with super glue will stick really well and it will not come apart. So just make sure you give it a good full minute of this holding it together thing. Finally, stretch a spot of tape over each of the ends that you've glued together and then take this thing and set it aside, man, because you don't want to mess with it now. Let it get good and solid. All right, guys, if you're the squeamish type, close your eyes because I'm about to commit heresy here. I'm going to open this hole up just a little bit so I can fit my fuse holder in this radio chassis. This is the best way I can think of. It's close to the power supply. The hole already exists, and all I needed to do is to open it up a little bit. So close your eyes. Once the hole is the right size for the uh, fuse holder, then go ahead and grab yourself a round file and clean the burr off from your drilling. That way you're not tearing up the plastic fuse holder. Be real careful, you don't want to scratch this chassis up. Even though I opened up a hole and changed it a little bit, I still want it to look good and I want it to look original. So be real gentle here. And also be mindful of what's on the other side of the hole as you're sticking the round file in there and moving it around. These type of fuse holders come with a nut and a star washer that go on the inside of the chassis. And then there's a paper or rubber or cardboard gasket that will go on the outside of the chassis. That gives it kind of a finished look and also keeps crap from getting inside from, from the outside. So go ahead and mount this thing up to the chassis and then we'll make the electrical connections in a few minutes. This requires kind of a large wrench. For most of mine, it's about a 17 millimeter. But uh, even though it's a fairly large size, this thing is made of plastic and the threads are plastic. So when you're wrenching this thing down, don't lever it like crazy, man. Just, uh, just, you know, just use your fingers on the very um, choke up close to the head of the wrench. Don't grab it and use it as a big lever. Choke up on it like this and use your fingers. You want to apply just a little bit of torque. You don't want to strip those plastic threads. And believe me, it's easy to do. What we're looking at front and center here is the volume control and power switch. And it's on that switch that the line, this brown cord, the line cord comes in and it attaches to this terminal that's closest to us on the bottom. And we want to make sure, that's what we want to remove from the power switch, and we're going to run a line from the, from the fuse instead. I'm going to use a simple terminal strip with two terminals and a ground lug. I like these ones that, you find these a lot, they were meant for TVs, I think, where they did wire wrapping. I like to use these because it's easy to get uh, the components wrapped around them. Go ahead and remove that original line wire from the power switch. As you can see, I just used one of the existing holes to mount the uh, terminal strip. Here the thermistor is in place and that line wire is connected up to one side of the fuse. I'm going to solder it in a minute. I'll just go ahead and finish up all this wiring and I'll explain what I did here in just a minute. I'm just doing all little wiring tricks. I put a little jumper wire from the fuse to one side of the thermistor. That, uh, then I connect the long line from the other side of the thermistor off to the power switch. I wrap it around one side of the power, the, the line, uh, the power line so that I can try and eliminate noise. And hook it into the power switch, do a little curly cue right here, get it ready to solder, and then just go in there with my soldering iron in and out real quick. You don't want to overheat this switch. Let me show you how the wiring goes. Here's the brown line cord. It used to go right to the power switch. Now it goes over here to the fuse, goes through the fuse. I've got a one and a half amp fuse in there. 
and it comes out of the fuse on this side right over here. Then it goes over to one side of the thermistor. It goes through the CL90 thermistor and then off to the power switch. Like I said, this is a one and a half amp fuse. That's a CL90 thermistor. I get these at, uh, at Mauser. I push it up against the chassis here so that it can eliminate as much heat as possible into the metal of the chassis. And you'll be able to feel a warm spot there when the radio is playing. So that's, uh, that's really all there is to it. This should work out great. Okay, I'm set up to do an alignment on the Zenith now. What it calls for is an IF of 455. And of course, the first thing you always do are the, the uh, IF transformers. So I'm set up to do that. Now, this is, uh, this is the second IF transformer here, and this is the first IF transformer. So you always tune the second IF transformer first, and you try to tune the last um the the secondary of the second first and then you do the primary of the second then you do secondary of the first and primary of the first so and these are labeled these are um designated on the schematic as a b c d so i'm going to start with d you're supposed to set the dial at 600 uh, kilohertz which i've done turn the volume of the radio all the way up and turn the signal output as low as possible. Now I've set my signal generator, it's reading right now 454.95, that's pretty, pretty close. So I'd be happy with that. Now I plugged it into the radio and I'm gonna go ahead and hook this up to the IF, I'm sorry, to the, uh, 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 the grid of the 6D8, the uh, first detector tube. So here we go, it's hooked up. Supposed to run a signal as low as possible to, to be able to do this job, which is what I have. I have learned that this radio is sensitive when you use a metal screwdriver for tuning the IF cans at least. So I'm going to have to set this aside and use this plastic one, even though this plastic one I don't like as much. So let's see if we can do this. First we'll do D. Okay, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm reading my fuel printer, you can't see it, but there's just too much on the table to move it around. And I'm trying to peak it. When you're doing IFs, you're trying to peak the signal. This is a permanent magnet speaker, so I'm connected directly up to the speaker voice coil leads. And I'm reading AC voltage across those voice coil leads. Okay, now I'll do... The secondary of the primary, or the first IF. A little more touchy than the first IF was, or the second IF was. Wants to oscillate. What you didn't see is that I increased the attenuation out of my signal generator so that I wasn't overwhelming this thing because even with the thing turned all the, all the way down, the output level turned all the way down, it was overwhelming the radio. Um, once I attenuated even further with the medium, attenu the medium attenuation selection on, on the uh, signal generator, it lowered the signal level to a point where I could tune this without the automatic volume control interfering. So when you would hear that, that uh, signal rise suddenly and then drop back down, that's the automatic volume control kicking in, I believe. And uh, that's why when I lowered the signal level, I was able to get this done. So let's, uh, let's see how we're doing now when I try to tune in the station. Let's disconnect this signal generator. The next step in the alignment procedure is to make sure that the oscillator corresponds with what's being read on the dial. So what we do is um, 
we uh, hook the the signal generator now up to the antenna post, and we use a dummy in, a dummy antenna instead of a half a microfarad, which is what was used for the first part. We use a 200 picofarad, and I'll go grab one of those, and uh, I'll be ready to hook it back up. I've got a 200 picofarad capacitor. I'll go ahead and put that in line here with the signal generator. Now I'm supposed to hook this up to the antenna post, so I'll get I'll do that. So that means I'll disconnect. I'll disconnect from my long wire. The Zenith radios are great. That hardly made any difference. Okay, now I'll do that in a second. First, let me get the generator set up. I'm setting the, the test generator up to 1500 kilocycles, so let me get that done. Okay, so I'm at 14999. That should do pretty well. Uh, let me go ahead and hook this up to the antenna. See what we get. Now, I won't hear anything until I'm tuned at the radio to 1500, so I'm going to set the dial at 1500. I'm close. Here we go. You're coming in. There we go. Okay, so it's a little off. It's a little bit off, but not by far. And so I am going to tune uh, trimmer F. Okay, trimmer F happens to be right up in front, right up here. Uh, you can't see it. Let me see if I can turn the radio just a tiny bit. Okay, there is a line of trimmers right here that I will tune now. Okay, so you turn this up. And I'm supposed to adjust, adjust this until I peek it. So the next step, according to the instructions, is the alignment of the antenna and detector. So the same deal, I'm going to set this at 1500, and I'm going to uh, use the 200 microfarad capacitor, or picofarad capacitor, and I'm going to adjust G and H. G and H are right up here on the, uh, on the tuning condenser. That's about peaked. We'll do both of them twice. Set it at 600. But it's real easy. That pattern is right, right up front here. It's J. And so let me go ahead and get that done. Still a 200 microfarad. And I'm adjusting J. I got to set the the oscillator to 600. Okay, 600. 600.005, pretty close. I don't think I'm going to have any trouble here. Decreases it. I have found sometimes when it whistles to do two up it just a little bit, otherwise it would whistle in the radio. Okay, let's let's try this. Let's hook up to an antenna. We're going to change your life. Yes, sir. How old are you? How old am I? Your rebellion, your infidelity has ignited the factions. <laughs> Let's see if we can't set up some automatic stations. 
this is always kind of fun. I'm going to sit down while I do this. I don't need a signal generator for this. I 99. That's less than two cents per card. And I'm just going to set them at whatever station sound good. Weekends, people angry over the U.S. health care. Fair enough. The voters spare him black. The organization has seen a lot of changes over the past century. That's how much things have changed. In the sight of sin, you see Adam and Eve were exiled from the garden because of sin. Just to raise enough money to pay for liability insurance, to protect themselves from lawsuits. That's right, 32,000 boxes and troops in other cities that had to sell them. Okay, I was able to get a couple of these presets to work, but they were pretty worn out. The threads are bunged up. You try to turn them and they tighten up. They, they, they uh, are cross-threaded or something. It's not something I would have seen when I was cleaning it before because the threads are internal to the things and there's nothing in the tubes where the coils are. And there's really nothing I can do about this. These things, I find a lot of them that are messed up because you get kids that were messing with them. You get people trying to adjust them, and they're really fine brass threads, and they get bunged up all the time. So the best policy on these is to leave them be. So I'll show I you what I have launch, here. Uh, to this point, knowing so that, that one works. Weather and that one I can't get to tune. I can't get that screw to turn. Have that weapons. one works. That one, same deal. I can't get that. that this is so loose it won't turn. It's all stripped. This one here works sometimes. So we're going to leave it be at that. That's the best I can get. One, two, three most of the time, and four. Four out of six. That's actually pretty good for these radios. So I'm going to go ahead and shut this radio down, and uh, we'll put this in the cabinet. Okay, I'm getting ready to mount this dial glass. And uh, I've already I put the new rubber on it. It's in it's held tightly now. The the uh, super glue has set, and I'm gonna go ahead and mount it. I've bent all of these tabs back enough so that I should be able to get the dial glass on there. Let's just see. And let me see here. This is how this is how it mounts. So the right side is where my little finger is right here. So. If I want to put a gap in the rubber at the top, I would put it here. So I'll go ahead and do that. And uh, hopefully all these tabs are bent enough so I can just drop this in place. Yep, there we go. Now, here's the hard part, the tricky part. Bending these tabs back without, without uh, upsetting the glass, without breaking any tabs. And you don't need it to be, we're not trying to, we're not securing a diamond in place. So these don't have to be the, the, the jewel holders on a diamond ring, okay? They just need to hold that glass steady. And you want to do, I do two at a time, two opposing ones at a time, just to get them kind of in position. And then I go with the pliers and I tweak them a little bit. But you see, they will break. You have to be careful with them. Okay. The idea with these is to kind of do a twisting motion, see, like so. That way you kind of curl the finger so that it grabs the rubber without trying to bend it toward the glass too much. And that, that's what I have found works for me. You may find something different when you do your zenith. These are tricky and, uh, you know, there is no easy answer. So you just twist it. You just twist it until it just touches the rubber, and by the time you get all the way around to the other side, usually you've they'll be tight enough to secure the rubber pretty well. The last thing you want to do is push too hard against the glass and chip it or crack it. it this this style glass is actually quite fragile. I've replaced a lot of them. A lot about half of these zeniths that come to me have broken dial glass and I buy the plastic dial covers from dialcovers.com that's really the best answer I like the plastic better even though it scratches easier than glass does it also doesn't break as easily you can bump it without breaking it 
and if it does crack it's not going to fall apart and be sharp and cut people there we go okay then you check and see oh good grief why didn't you stop me I'm, I'm such an idiot I'm sitting here doing the video not paying attention and I put the glass in upside down brilliant 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 okay so this is one of those videos that's an example of what you should not do okay pay attention to what you're doing don't do what I did and put the glass in the right way because otherwise you'll feel stupid like I do I'm gonna put this video up anyway because people need to see that this can happen this glass it's, it's deceiving you're sitting under some bright fluorescent lights and uh, <laughs> I missed uh, the direction it was curved so excited about getting it in and getting this done. I'm almost done with this radio and I want it out of here. So that's all right. I'll get it there. Okay, you just if you bend them too many times, they'll break. So that's the problem. And uh, taking this in and out of the fingers too many times will peel that rubber off the glass. This was such a crappy mounting scheme. I don't know, you know, the Zenith people, brilliant radio engine, engineers, but they weren't so good at the mechanical side. Their tuning mechanisms were over engineered, and this thing here was under engineered. Okay, great. All right, let's uh, let's see if we can do this right now without breaking any. It takes a lot of care, guys. I'm not saying I know the only way to do it. I just know a way that has worked for me. You want to be careful not to handle them too much from these wings because they break off. By wings, I mean these sections here. Next time you see me doing this, would you please say something before I get it done? And whisper it. I don't want to be embarrassed. Okay. There we go. How's that, guys? What do you think? Will that work? So it's going to sit like this. And I'll get a razor in here and I'll clean up some of this dry glue. There's just a little bit of residue. That always happens. So we'll get a knife in here. It's real simple. You just very, very carefully going to rub away the glue. You don't want to scratch the glass, so you're not pushing down hard when you're doing this, okay? You're just trying to chip away that whitish residue that happens sometimes on the edge. Not perfect, but it's pretty darn nice. All right. With that, I'm going to wrap it up for tonight. I have to I have a big day at work tomorrow, so I need to get hit the sack just a little bit early. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and get ready to do that. All right, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, next time you see this particular piece, it'll be on the radio. All right, folks, I'm going to wrap it up for tonight. The next video is going to be installing the radio into the cabinet, and then I'll do a real short video to demo the radio as well. So it always takes more videos than I think it will, but the long videos are done, and the next two videos, there will be two more, the next two videos will be pretty short. So... On a, a good Tuesday night, March 28th, this is Michael from your Western Outpost in Salt Lake City, and that's all for now.